well, we're a little bit after the time, so I, I think people are still arriving and taking their seats, but uh, we have a lot to cover today, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, gavel us to order. Um, welcome, everyone, to the uh, first uh, panel discussion of the 2020 fall semester of the Science Circle. Um, really pleased to uh, have with us today um, uh, several of our um, uh, favorite panelists. We have um, uh, <clears throat> Robert Hendricks, tagline. We have Stephen Gazier, um, uh, Stephen Zutify, and Phil Youngblood, Vic, who uh, we all know, <laughs> know and love. Um, Today's topic is going to be ethics dimensions in scientific research, uh, which I confess initially might seem a little bit dry, but I think uh, we're going to have a lot of interesting discussion on this because we have some really um, interesting um, aspects from which to look at ethical considerations. Um, Robert is going to talk to us about uh, using animals in scientific research. Um, and he has an, a really nice presentation prepared for us about that. Um, and then uh, Stephen will talk to us about the ethics of gene editing, which um, I think uh, will also be of great interest to all of us. Um, you know, gene editing is going to have a huge impact on the future. And then uh, uh, finally, uh, Phil is going to uh, sort of lead a discussion uh, to kind of speculate about the ethics of colonizing um, other planets. Um, and I think uh, um, uh, that is, it's a, uh, you know, a little bit uh, speculative, but has, has I think, uh, acquired uh, a new urgency uh, with the discovery of phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus, which is highly suggestive of the possibility of some kind of microbial life in the upper atmosphere of Venus, because phosphine is basically a product of biological processes. It's very hard to make inorganically. And in fact, the, uh, the surface of Mars does not really have the proper conditions to make phosphine as far as we know. So, so this is a really tantalizing new result that was announced about um, so I think that will be a fun discussion, too. Um, before we get started, let me remind everyone that the Science Circle is a grant-funded nonprofit uh, dedicated to the mission of developing virtual world platforms for education. Um, uh, so I just caution you to be on your best behavior. Try not to grief or troll us too badly, please. Um, uh, and uh, so I think uh, with those brief announcements, let's go ahead and uh, and get into it. Uh, hopefully we can, and if we have time at the end, we may be able to address some additional uh, concerns. You know, things like um, um, uh, uh, sort of junk science, um, uh, shady journals, uh, other sorts of aspects of scientific ethics like that that we might be able to touch on maybe uh, at the end if we have time. Open discussion. All right, with that, uh, Robert, would you please uh, take the mic and uh, and give us your presentation? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Good. I want to start with the definition: animal ethics. It's a branch of ethics which examines human-animal relationships the moral consideration of animals and how non-human animals ought to be treated. I want to put up front here about, uh, you know, it, it, this has a broad spectrum of interpretation and it changes over time, generally going to more civilized uh, compared to the 18th and 19th centuries particularly, but, uh, some ask if it's okay to have pets. You know, it's people say I own a pet and that sort of thing. Are these questions about that? And just to put that question to rest at the out front here, uh, I think that falls under the category of loving who you want, having the freedom and uh, liberty to love who you want to love. 
and love a pet and they love you back and they have a happy, uh, safe life. That's wonderful. So, um, the age of enlightenment is a big determinant on in what many in the Western world have uh, known in the lifetime uh, during the 20th century and 21st century. Uh, it basically was the birth of uh, classical liberalism. I think John Locke was a uh, proponent of classical liberalism. And what that means is that individuals had civil rights. They had uh, inherent rights by which they uh, lived under rule of law and had liberty. And um, uh, it um, wasn't uh, legal to get their door kicked in in the middle of the night and be assaulted by uh, uh, government agents who decided that they wanted to take them out for one reason or another, like in my old hometown of Louisville, Kentucky, uh, with Brianna Taylor. But um, uh, that's the, uh, uh, there's little difference in that from the th knock at the door at three in the morning, which didn't even happen, I don't think. It was just the door was kicked in. But anyway, utilitarianism was an outgrowth of this. I'm going to just make a quick statement. Uh, John Stuart Mill, incredibly brilliant individual and outstanding on a lot of uh, um, frontiers. For one thing, he was a big proponent of women's rights, and that was in the mid 19th century, um, the Victorian era. Um, that was quite controversial. And uh, one of the, uh, well, the utilitarianism, in a, in a word, it means uh, uh, party hardy and don't hurt anybody. Uh, try to be happy and help everybody to be happy as possible and uh, avoid doing negative stuff. One of the uh, shortcomings of the philosophy is that it underrates how many people maybe um, uh, want to uh, tr uh, walk over other people to be happy. Or uh, like I met Arthur Schlesinger Jr. once and he uh, was a historian and in the JFK, uh, John F. Kennedy uh, cabinet. And he said there's a, in the United States there's always been a group of people throughout the history of the United States which wanted to put everybody in their place and um, they seem to be reborn every generation. So uh, uh, at any rate, there are people who want to be happy by uh, uh, having their foot on your neck. But uh, uh, it, it's a philosophy that assumes uh, reasonable, uh, rational thinking on the part of others that's similar to the philosopher and uh, a quality of goodwill. I have a quote here from Delana, uh, Delanda the Finn <laughs> that she sent me uh, describing information about this. This is going to be available in, in a PDR um, that, um, or PDF, I mean, um, uh, PDR is a phys physician's desk reference, <laughs> which is mostly electronic anymore. Uh, yeah, we, we will talk about that a bit, Vic. Uh, but at any rate, I'll let you read this on your own. But basically, uh, Jeremy Bantham, whose uh, skeleton and with his wax head is displayed here uh, in his own clothing, um, uh, English philosopher, a bit eccentric, and, and like Stuart Mill, John Stuart Mill was um, influential in economics, was also a proponent of... Um, and a founder of the utilitarianism a branch of philosophy. And basically, it's um, how to be happy and um, how not to make other everybody else unhappy. Um, that being said, uh, when civil rights 
of regular citizens who, like men, who uh, served in the military, you know, not women and not uh, uh, the uh, classes that were kept from power, but of male citizens, and they couldn't even be safe until this classic liberalism uh, took hold and uh, French Revolution was uh, something of an out uh, of a spinoff of that and uh, uh, other issues came up like slavery, uh, animal abuse, um, uh, child abuse. One interesting point was uh, in um, uh, the mid 19th, well, late 19th century, the first documented case of uh, reported child abuse in the United States uh, was uh, 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 noted. And it was this uh, little girl whose mother was, um, the husband had died and she was totally out of uh, luck. And uh, her child was uh, taken for her by a charitable organization who later gave the child over to uh, people claiming to be the parents who were frauds. And when the mother returned for her, she was said that, uh, told the child was dead. At any, any rate, this child spent about seven years living one place and another with this family that were uh, treated her worse than a dog was treated back in the 19th century. And uh, uh, I can tell you uh, some stories, but I won't. <laughs> uh, from my own experiences. But um, at any rate, somebody noted and was concerned and to put an end to it, uh, they had to bring evidence to this attorney by the name of Henry Berg, who uh, was uh, well-to-do and uh, had a fascinating history. And I put the link to this um, blog of, um, of uh, uh, New York archives of uh, uh, and, and New York history archives. Um, he was the founder of the American Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. And he took on this case. This little girl got help from the Humane Society or the, you know, the ASPCA. Um, uh, and she was rescued and actually lived into the 50s, 1950s. And she had scars on her face and her legs and all over her body from being physically abused. But I just thought that was really uh, kind of fascinating that uh, that's what it took. He, he would go head to head against people like P.T. Barnum. That was before people like P.T. Barnum could get elected president. Uh, and uh, he was concerned about the abuse of the uh, uh, animals used in the circus and everything else. I'm going to jump ahead. 1948 uh, was uh, in response to the Holocaust. The Holocaust begot a big uh, revulsion and uh, swing of the pendulum. And uh, Eleanor Roosevelt was a great champion uh, for human rights. And uh, this is from a speech she gave at the Sorbonne on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights for the United Nations. She was on a little committee, a, a couple of old men who thought they would just sideline her and put up with her. And she won them over and basically took direction of it. She was an extraordinary um, a visionary and a person of great heart. And uh, uh, the human rights, interest and concern about human rights, and that is a, a, a bulwark of the mission of the UN, uh, which authoritarians absolutely hate, uh, came out of her efforts, which were a response to what was discovered uh, in the atrocities from World War II. 
Now, the first law in, on Earth to regulate animal experimentation was in Great Britain, 1876. Uh, Britain has often, uh, at least from an American point of view, often been a great moral leader. Uh, and uh, I say that to Irish friends, and uh, sometimes they bristle, <laughs> and Scottish too. Uh, I'm a gamish, so uh, at any rate, I can say these things. But uh, 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 they they have had uh, uh, more uh, influence by philosophical, rational thinking than uh, uh, sooner than many people. It took the 19, the United States until the 1960s to respond uh, to concerns about animal abuse, um, not just beating dogs, but taking piglets and castrating them without anesthesia. So they'll put on weight. Uh, their, uh, the anesthesia was someone holding their legs. Things like this, uh, farming practices were um, utterly cruel. I'm not saying every farmer didn't have a heart, uh, but Animals were it, it, it played down as not having any any sense, not really knowing what was going on, not remembering anything, and I, I think all these sorts of things have been uh, dismissed. There were two landmark articles, Sports Illustrated in '65 and Life Magazine in 1966, so it created some political pressure to give the uh, U.S. Congress some mojo to deal with it. This was uh, from the Life Magazine article, uh, and it was entitled, and, and that was in 1966. It was entitled uh, Concentration Camps for Dogs. I'm going to read to you, it's a small here, but I'm going to read to you the, um, just the top bit. The dog's name is Lucky. He's a lemon-colored English pointer with a fine head and subtle signs of good, expensive breeding. But when a woman from the Animal Rescue Institute came across Lucky at a Sulphur, Oklahoma fair. Three weeks ago, this is what she saw. Pathetic, emaciated horror, towering, hopeless, and up for auction. Woman bought him for $3 plus a dollar for the chain. The problem was animals were being stolen, pets, or, uh, Livestock as property was a bit more protected, um, especially um, you think out west, rustling cattle, that's a major theft. But uh, And stealing a person's horse when they're out uh, in the wilderness, that's a, a, akin to murder. Uh, but uh, um, uh, dogs had little protection. Uh, here's another picture, the Life magazine in the 60s was a weekly journal and it had great impact. Uh, people looked forward to it and it had great distribution. And uh, uh, 1965, Sports Illustrated actually did an article called um, Pepper Goes Missing. And Pepper was this Dalmatian and you can read about it. I gave a link to it. Um, and um, this is part of the history of the American Welfare Act, uh, Animal Welfare Act, I mean. Um, uh, but that's a picture of Pepper. Pepper was stolen from a farm in Pennsylvania, handed from uh, dealer to dealer, dealer. There were puppy mills and uh, people that would buy and sell animals for uh, abuse. Uh, and it was all for a quick buck, and uh, no records were kept, and um, they tracked it down and discovered that Pepper had been used in experimentation uh, in surgeries um, in a hospital in Brooklyn, I think, and then killed and cremated. And um, that uh, 
sort of thing, plus this woman whose name you should know, Christine Stevens. She was a lovely, charming person who um, was uh, uh, like Eleanor Roosevelt, able to convince people, able to win them over and persistent. Uh, she devoted her life to protecting creatures all sizes and including uh, laboratory animals. Uh, she founded the Animal Welfare Institute in New York in 1951. Uh, this was from her obituary, it was uh, I think about 30 years later. But um, she worked on all kinds of things to, uh, in terms of infrastructure to uh, have it more compatible with animals being able to survive and uh, protecting birds. And uh, um, she also is considered the mother of the Animal Welfare Act and Endangered Species Act. Um, she, um, formed in 1955 a Society for Animal Protection Legislation, which was the Institute, the Animal Welfare Institute's lobbying arm. And they fought hard for a 1958 um, uh, Humane Slaughter Act, and in 1966 achieved the Laboratory Animal Welfare Act, um, which was signed into law by Lyndon B. Baines Johnson. She worked for free. She worked for passion. Um, she also addressed elephant tusks and the elephant trade, problems that are still on, ongoing. This gentleman, Representative Joseph Resnick, was an inventor. He invented ant antennas that helped uh, in reception for television and the development of television as a major form of communication as communication, and he was a congressman from New York. He was a sponsor, primary sponsor of the Laboratory Animal Welfare Bill. He was influenced by Christine Stevens and by the story of Pepper. And one reason I'm telling you about this is because you don't have to be famous and you don't have to be super rich, uh, uh, powerful, uh, you don't even have to be in political office, uh, have a heart and be dedicated and uh, um, speak to people, find people of good heart and you can make a difference. Also, if you write, I used to see in this crass consumerism uh, with uh, their uh, bumper stickers on their cars saying whoever dies with the most, the man who dies with the most toys wins. And I always felt the individual who dies with the most published and the most writing, uh, left in writing. Uh, writing is a, a huge way to uh, make a difference in the world. So ethics of medical research started to emerge uh, in uh, the 60s, uh, there were, um, uh, it, it applied to, and this is an, an important paragraph here, it was limited, this initial act was limited warm-blooded animals and didn't cover most of those. Mice, rats, birds were excluded, fish were excluded as well. I mentioned them because they're vertebrates. Uh, other acts came out in 1970, a Horse Protection Act. In 1972, marine, an, uh, marine mammals protecting whales, porpoises, seals, and polar bears in the Marine Mammal Protection Act of 1972. Um, and it dealt with killings and takings of, uh, of these animals for uh, research purposes and, and uh, insisted if it had to be done, it must be done humanely and this sort of thing. 1973, the Endangered um, and Threatened Species Act was passed, and this is all in American legislation. I'm not that familiar with uh, uh, legislation from other countries, but I would point out that those three, horses, marine ma um, mammals, and endangered and threatened species, those laws were signed into law by Richard Nixon. So 
Yay, tricky dick. Um, violations of this law are dealt with by the Secretary of the Agriculture and a few other services. That all sounds good. It, it's generally created to um, uh, push for oversight on how animals are dealt with, and it focuses on their housing, so they have uh, habitation that is uh, suitable to their needs, as opposed to like a narrow uh, pen uh, with pigs that can't even turn around. They're stuck in one position their entire uh, lives. Uh, and also pain control, which was not being regarded by researchers particularly. They felt like animals really don't feel it and they don't remember it. Um, but then physicians, uh, I don't know if this is still done, but uh, when I was in medical school, the circumcisions were done without anesthesia. He said, uh, they don't feel anything at this age. Yeah, why don't you do it on yourself and see what it feels like. So that was the feeling I got from it. Well, this enforcement, I mean, you have to have somebody in charge, but if you get um, people who are trolls and um, agents of corporations and like the um, uh, uh, admiral uh, who uh, never went to sea, uh, really don't deal with uh, animal husbandry and animal slaughter and the torture that uh, animals go through in agriculture and in laboratories, uh, they can be pretty detached and not, and, and even with that, the, the um, fines of $1,000, I mean, it's a slap on the wrist, it's, it, it isn't enough, but uh, there have been amendments and, uh, 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 there, it, one of the things that it requires an institutional uh, animal care in research that they have an, ins a, an institutional committee that includes a veterinarian that is not part of the uh, part of the system, and I think generally uh, people that are not. Uh, um, uh, in the system, they're just regular citizens uh, hoping to get somebody of normal uh, uh, level of humanity. Won't just, you know, accept authority when they're told, well, this is the way we do it. Um, there's a thing called the three R's. I'll just mention quickly replacement, reduction, refinement. And it's basically uh, uh, strategies to um, uh, minimize or reduce what animals go through in research and uh, the level of animal that uh, in terms of uh, if they can go to invertebrates or into to lower animals or uh, and they can uh, 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 avoid using uh, uh, primates as much or whatever. Now, when I, I was at University of Pennsylvania, there was a um, uh, 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 marked a uh, series of attacks on uh, labs. And um, uh, yes, there was a neurosurgeon or an, a, a neurophysiologist who was uh, doing experiments with, uh, actually with monkeys. And he was smashing their heads in without anesthesia or sedation. And the argument was that it would change the uh, inflammatory process in the brain that would, uh, that causes further brain damage um, and uh, a um, supporter of PETA, which really emerged in the 80s and was part of this growing animal rights movement, uh, blew the whistle on it. And uh, uh, it, uh, the courts uh, sort of shied away from it. The courts are afraid to get into litigation and, and, and afraid to get into elements of animal rights and uh, uh, there would be no end to it. Uh, I think it's going to have to come from uh, uh, legislation. Uh, 
uh, a couple more points. I'm going to pass out a note card. I, I don't want to dominate the time. I've already talked too long. Uh, there are, uh, I think Vic mentioned sp uh, speciesism, which is assumption of human superiority leading to exploitation of animals. A um, moral ethics philosoph a philosopher who's uh, uh, named um, um, uh, uh, Peter Singer, he's an Australian, um, wrote a book in 1975 called uh, Animal Liberation, A New Ethics for Treatment of Animals. That's going to be on a note card I'm going to try to pass around and I'll give it to a few people and maybe you can pass it to everybody else. Uh, and uh, these are recommended reading. One reason why I re relate that his thinking to the Holocaust is his parents fled Austria, they fled Vienna after the Anschluss, um, went to Australia, and uh, I think suffering, including cultural suffering, can uh, get greater humanity at times. Sometimes it gets um, more savagery. Uh, another book that's very important in this is the case for human, uh, the case for animal rights, 1983, which uh, was written by uh, a philosopher uh, from the uh, North Carolina State University in Raleigh, North, which is near me, uh, Tom Regan, and he was very influential in the animal rights movement. But Singer is uh, cited as kind of a major catalyst in the growth of the um, of the uh, animal rights movement. So there was more I'd like to say, but it's uh, too much. And I'm going to cut off here, except to say that, um, yes, that's going to be on the note card I'm going to have um, passed out. Um, uh, as you know, the, the, I heard Paul Ehrlich once say, um, that and he asked about what about animals you know uh, for slaughterhouses and he says well there are animals born to die and they're doomed and they're there for industrial production for food and our needs you know because you need belts and shoes and uh, <clears throat> you know, that sort of thing i hear someone clearing the throat so uh, uh as the um uh food sources and food practices for people uh, change and become more um, uh, uh, vegetarian, less dependent on um, uh, uh, traditional agricultural development or production, uh, people are going to question all the more the use of like taking pigs who are smart intelligent, sentient, emotional animals uh, and using them, making cuts so that you can uh, study wound healing in their skin. Um, and uh, which is an experiment I saw somebody doing, uh, they were a resident and had a required requirement to produce research. Uh, some of this research is crap and it uh, is abusive uh, to use animals for it, and, but it's just somebody not thinking it through, and it's a, a cultural thing. So, Age of Enlightenment, utilitarianism, civil rights for humans, humane, humanist treatment of people, and you have the inevitable question, why not animals too? What's the difference? And there is good research that animals have emotions and have thoughts and have memories and um, they, like us, avoid pain and seek pleasure. Um, so I'll end there. Thanks so much. Fantastic, Robert. Uh, with regard to that last point, I will refer people to uh, last year's uh, presentation on uh, animal behavior and animal uh, problem solving, animal learning. Um, we touch on some of those topics about um, how uh, animal emotions, for example. Um, so, um, so feel free to check out the Science Circle website for that. Um, I, I actually have some 
uh, specific items about the the animal ethics that I'd like to touch on, but um, I'm going to bite my tongue and hold that. See if we have some time at the end. Um, uh, in the interest of time, let's uh, move on to um, Stephen's presentation on gene editing and CRISPR and the uh, ethical considerations in the use of uh, of that powerful tool. And so, Stephen, please take the mic and and uh, take it away. All right, thank you, Barragon. Thank you, everyone, for coming to this panel on ethics. Again, something that I want to try and convince people that we should be thinking a lot more, especially when it comes to, again, population-wide interventions we can do in terms of the germline and people's health and happiness. So I have a bit of a little bit of an organization I want to do, which is just remind people what CRISPR does, because this is a step level change, this technology in the ability to do very precise genome modification. I think that that's useful. And again, I will be limiting my talk to um, think about human ethics. Uh, there's actually a great story when you, th when you think about pig castration that we, there are ways to av avoid pig castration using CRISPR. And there actually is a company that's out there trying to market those pigs now and get them past regulatory hurdles in Europe. Uh, but we'll talk about humans. I do want to give a brief history of eugenics, because uh, I think that that is something that I think we really, this is an example where history is a very important place to look to inform what we want to do now. And I'll talk about uh, some of the, the modern ideas and credos behind the, the regulations and the thoughts about modern genome editing. And then finally, uh, to try and pose some questions, get people to ask, think about what they think. So. Um, the first, just quick reminder, and I have some slides up here, uh, if you look up a little bit above us, of the idea that bacteria have these very primitive, in a sense, immune systems, but they're very effective at trying to destroy invading DNA or RNA. So again, bacteria die by the gazillion trillions from viruses. And so they need to have defenses, not only that can help attack and defend against the virus, but then to remember that they've been attacked by a particular virus before. So that way they have a thing called immunological memory. It's kind of like what we have with vaccines, although we do it from a very different cellular level. So this idea of a immunological memory is really important. And that's something that developed over evolution. But the key part of this immune system is the ability to detect a particular sequence and then cut that DNA or RNA. And if you're cutting it, then the virus can't do viral things. And that's a really key part to how um, how these work. So we have, through the efforts of, again, I would say at this point, probably thousands of scientists, if maybe not even tens of thousands of scientists, have found ways to harness this for human genome editing, in addition to animals, mosquitoes, insects, uh, bacteria, yeast, all these other things. And so I don't want to get too caught up in the technical parts of it. The main thing I want to point out here is that I've, I've done the science, I've seen the scientists that are doing this, and I've seen the progress that's being made, and I know the specific technical hurdles. But within the next 10 years, I just wanna posit this, in the next 10 years, we can probably safely, effectively, high efficiency, make the vast majority of genomic changes we'd wanna make that have some purpose in humans. And so, that is, I think, where we want to have this discussion in terms of ethics, that we really aren't thinking about technical limitations, because that's been a lot of the topic right now. People say, oh, we shouldn't do this, we shouldn't do that. Um, and that's true. I don't want to get away from that conversation right now. But I think in the next 10 years, we need to be having a conversation now about the idea that we can do almost anything we want in terms of genetic. So the bottom part of this slide is just a quick reminder that there are two types of tissues in human bodies. There's the germline, and then there's somatic tissues. And the main thing is if you think about your own body, all the tissues that you think about, with one exception, are somatic. And that is, they are differentiated, they cannot make more humans, or they're not uh, capable of being, you know, a haploid egg or sperm that can make a new human. And that a lot of times you can do interventions that are therapeutic that are some tissues, not others, 
or even at a very young age, you can make something somatic so that it affects the majority of tissues, but that doesn't get propagated next generation. And so the other part, germline, and that's what's shown up here on the right in this panel, is that if we find a way to edit either before fertilization or very early in the embryo, then all the cells can have that genetic change and then it can be passed on to the next generation. So I think that is, that is a distinction that we want to talk about. And, and of course, uh, Syzygy mentions the movie Gattaca, and I think that's um, a little bit of what we want to talk about. I think maybe we're not quite to that science fiction part idea yet. So I wanted to frame the conversation this way that I think a lot of, I, I'm actually going to come back to the ethics of the distinction of somatic versus germline. But one thing that I think we're already doing as a society is trying to use CRISPR for therapeutics. And this is something that is primarily in somatic tissues. We're doing it for say cancer therapies, uh, immunological T cell therapy. We're trying to fix, uh, I think people are targeting deafness. We're also talking about sickle cell anemia or beta thalassemias. These are things that we can do somatically. And I really don't think that many people think of that as a, as a hard ethics issue because it's just like another therapeutic. So we'll get deeper into the other parts and just, so let's talk about eugenics. And the term comes from like, kind of means born well. That is like a good body is the birth, is the organism that's being born. And uh, this basically started with, with Galton. And historically, the idea was selective breeding. Again, this is something that came from the late 19th century. Um, although I'd say modern day, we're now at this point where we're like, oh, you know, genome editing is a new type of eugenics. And eugenics, I think anybody who hears the term immediately has it in a bad frame of mind. And I'm not going to dispute that because given the context of the time, <laughs> eugenics was basically a pretty horribly uh, discriminatory concept. And just to point out specifically how institutionalized this was, this was a big institution that there were international congresses on eugenics that featured scientists, politicians, very influential, important people. Uh, but again, the, the origins came from Sir Galton and believe that you could selectively breed to um, have a better human race. Now, of course, if you, anybody want to hazard a guess as to what the best human race was in Galton's idea, in Galton's mind, yeah, white British men, essentially. And so, again, this comes back to the idea that, um, you know, the context of time that whatever frame of reference you want for what is the best thing, honestly seems to come back around to the idea of if you're the one who has the idea or holds the power, then somehow you are, you are the best one. Now, um, yeah, we'll get to that in just a second, Barry Don. Uh, now, but interestingly, the United States kind of took it a different way. When this concept got to the United States, they actually wanted to actively get rid of undesirable traits. And that's in quotes. Because, uh, again, we're talking about from a perspective of who's in power and what they consider to be undesirable. And this is another quick point I want to make is that no matter how bad and you feel about the United States and its politics and its government and any number or the people or any number of things going on, you don't know the history of the early 2000s <laughs> because the United States was incredibly racist, incredibly isolationist. And these are the types of things that people thought were undesirable were um, people with mental retardation or and in addition to the racism, the mental retardation, um, the homosexuality, those types of things. And uh, and Mike Shaw says it still is. And I'll, I'll, I'll agree with that. But I think the, the extent and degree to which we're talking and the institutionalization of some of these things is is quite a bit of a step change between. Uh, one example of this is in 1911, there was an establishment of the eugenics records office. And I mentioned this because the goal was they were actually trying to document and track what was or was not undesirable. And oddly enough, they came up with the conclusion that people who were poor and low income and in low social standing were also the undesirables, which, you know, fancy that. Anyway, uh, again, I don't want to get too much of a conversation about the politics, but I do want to remind people that that this was a different frame of mind and that there was much more officialness to what eugenics was then. And this really goes into the concept that eugenics was a bad concept. Uh, again, if you extend a little bit over time, so Barragon mentioned the U.S. Supreme Court case. Uh, I have a link 
here uh, in my slide presentation, and if you remind, I'll try and remember to put in the local chat in just a second, a wonderful NPR interview on Fresh Air with uh, Andy Cohen, who wrote a book called Imbeciles. And this was in 2016. This is a 47 minutes period of your time that you would love. Um, but what he highlights in the book is a 1927 U.S. Supreme Court case that upheld the right by eight to one, an eight to one vote that they can forcibly sterilize people. And the, what's interesting about the specific case in terms of Carrie Buck was that she, in fact, there were no genetic indicators. She wasn't, she didn't suffer from any sort of genetic retardation or um, any diseases. She was actually sexually assaulted. And now because she was a morally unpure person, they wanted to put her in a colony and then forcibly sterilize her. And by the way, she was black. So this is the type of context that we have. And it's a, I, I need to read those books. It's like Stein Circle and Fresh Air always give me reading lists I can't handle. But, um, and of course, you know, Hitler, of course, took it to another level in terms of thinking about eugenics. And I don't want to talk too much about that either. I think some of the, the best writing on that comes from Stephen Jay Gould. And you can always go back and find the original Nuremberg laws that said Jews are, you know, we're going to pass laws that say, basically not people. Uh, and then the Wannsee Protocol, which again, uh, was what Stephen Jay Gould was writing about. This is actually where the Nazi officer sat down and actually discussed the dynamics and some of the context of, quote unquote, the final solution, which the actual eradication. So, you know, in context, I think, the, well, the main point I want to make about um, this is that there was an extremely wrong pointing moral compass uh, at the time for when we think about trying to do stuff on a eugenics type of level. And I think that this is something where we need to keep this in mind. And, oh yeah, so, and, and Sumo does a nice kind of point that, the Nazis learned from the eugenicists of the United States. You know, it's not like they came up with this by themselves. They, was, they saw this modeled by us uh, to, to come up with some of this. So let's just fast forward now to the modern day context, where again, I think, you know, we have a very different, um, again, like uh, talking about Stu uh, uh, John Stuart Mill and talking about unit utilitarianism and other moral frameworks in terms of how we think society should be how wealth and other riches should be distributed among populations uh, from a theoretical point of view, although obviously the practice of this is very different. And so right now I'd say the guiding principles, and this is codified early on when CRISPR was developed by the National Academy of Sciences, and I have this in the slide presentation, is you know, genome editing is powerful. And so, but what's the purpose of this? And when we wanna do therapy or intervene with it? And promoting well-being transparency, do care, responsible science, respect for persons, fairness, and transnational cooperation. These are some guiding principles behind genome editing. I think if you, it's hard to think of a farther contrast from early eugenics than that, those types of principles. And of course, this doesn't mean that people perfectly have executed this. Uh, when we think about the Chinese scientist, he, who basically genome edited two young, well, as zygotes, they're now young girls, to be hopefully resistant to getting infection by HIV. Now, I don't want to say some things in his defense that this is the type of idea where genome editing is helpful. If we could edit basically the entire human population, we could make us resistant to HIV entirely for the entire future of humanity until somehow it mutates or does uh, now, there are downsides, any therapy, and there are some things that are maybe downsides to that gene being edited, but this type of idea makes sense. Now, he was most criticized for point number two here, which is um, transparency, although I think also fairly, in terms of the responsible science, the, the type of editing and the type of results he could get, I think you can also, you know, fairly criticize how he went about it and the expected efficiency. But what's most recent, and this is actually just, this is a, a preprint, I'm showing this, is that basically a human consortium of genome editors, but then also now a publication by the National Academy of Sciences has this new book called Heritable, Heritable, Huno, ah, Heritable Huna, Human Genome Editing. And I think this is this guiding light, where again, some of the key points are to, to be responsible with science, to try and help people, 
And right now, what they really want to say is let's limit the only type of germline editing to diseases where we have a very clear case that are very detrimental to a person that have a high inheritance. And so I think this is something where um, really it's limiting, but I think it also maybe is that very good first step that if we can come to a common ground agreement on the types of things we want to target and change, that's a good place again. Again, this is an example of community trying to decide, although it's obviously scientists guiding the principle. And so this is kind of the, the points I want to pose now. These are some of like these big questions that I have also a little bit in my mind. I, I think I differ a little bit from some people. That you, you can say, maybe think of different tiers of genome editing. Uh, there's somatic manipulation, things that are very related to therapy, things that you can put in somatic tissues. Like, would it not be nice if we all could just have a, uh, an injection that made most of our cells resistant to getting COVID-19 right now, right? Um, vaccines, I think, are still very effective for this, but, you know, that's the same type of idea. There's other types of somatic manipulation, though, and these are the things that you might see from uh, movies like, uh, oh, now I'm, oh, yeah, so Gat Gattaca, kind of as an example, I'm blanking on the name of the other one I'm trying to think of, uh, the Van Damme movie with the uh, genetic enhancement. We can actually make people, we, we have genes, we have insights into things that make people smarter, stronger, anti-aging, maybe uh, things that take, think of a baseline human state and then our universal soldier, Baragon, thank you. Yes, that is perfect. I totally would blank on that one. One of my favorite science fiction movies. But this, um, these are manipulations that of course don't carry on, but can still provide either benefits to society, or again, I think the, the second tier is different because it's really providing benefits to an individual. And I'm just not sure that, you know, those are different tiers because of, I, I would say who really benefits from those types of things. Now, the other one, of course, now we're talking about germline manipulation, where again, we can think about the he uh, manipulated zygotes that are trying to preemptively be resistant to HIV or corrections to genetic diseases, Tay-Sachs disease, beta thalassemia, sickle cell anemia. Those are all things where then, once the one person's done, they can think about their next generation as driving benefit from that as well. And so, um, but then also we think, and the scary part that have a lot of people, and I think the germline consor the consortium wanted to be cautious about is the idea of why do we, do we wanna just enhance people to make them say smarter, better, faster, better, stronger, like $6 million man, but from a genetic point of view. And so I think, um, you know, that's another tier. Now, I do want to make a case, though, and this is something that I think is important to keep in mind, is that if, if we come to a point where you can have widespread and routine somatic functionally, that's different than germline, right? Something where you just, as an early child, you get a shot, then really what is the source of the dynamics of, the, of, the, of who owns the technology? And that is if every generation has to go get a shot, is that not conveying more power to corporations that provide the service as compared to just doing germline editing that then benefits people from then on and doesn't have a recurring cost from generation to generation. And so I do think that that is a point of view that a lot of people are very cautious about germline editing, but I do want to say that if we strongly go the route of only of not doing germline editing, then we're basically creating a power dynamic where somatic genome editing is always done by every generation, and there's a cost to that. Unless you can make a model where the cost is free. That again, you could imagine in certain types of government structures, uh, more like Starfleet or the Federation than what we have now, where it's just something, this is something where everybody would benefit at, at no cost. So I'd like so, to yeah. uh, um, explore this a little bit uh, deeper. I'm especially interested in this, the ethics of a human enhancement with gene editing. Um, I'm my assumption is that in 200 years, uh, gene editing technology is going to be so cheap and easy that it's going to be universal. Um, it's not going to be available only to the rich. It's going to be available universal, just like vitamins or something. Um, and that um, that is going to make um, uh, in the enhancing your children simply too seductive to resist and everyone's going to do it 
Um, and I think that if, in fact, that becomes the norm, that when you get pregnant, um, you, uh, you know, uh, you, uh, you know, inject yourself or whatever, whatever the delivery mechanism might be uh, with a suite of uh, of uh, of gene editing um, machines uh, that will enhance your children um, so that they're taller and healthier and smarter and all those kinds of things, better looking and stuff like that, that that is going to shift the ethical calculus um, so that um, in fact, it might be considered unethical to not edit your children, to not enhance your children. So, um, so in other words, when something becomes so universal and so accepted, if you're if you're bucking the trend, then you know you're the one who becomes suspect. Um, anybody? I mean, am I am I? Off? I just feel like if you're if you extrapolate this out hundreds of years, where it gets a little bit unpredictable. Um, to know what will happen, um, uh, I just it just feels inevitable to me that uh, that germline enhancement of our species is just inevitable, give, given enough time. So I'd sort of like to see what you all think about that. Uh, I'll mention one quick thing, but I'll agree with you. I think you know, any, like any technology, when we think about cars. Or we think about um, surgery, it starts out relatively crude and then becomes universal. Like defibrillators, right? I mean, anybody can have a heart attack now and get at least treated by somebody just right there safely. Um, you know, I don't think that the idea, one of the main problems with something being widespread, but also that costs money, is it extends rich poor gaps, it extends the privileged maintaining their privilege. Uh, maintains power structures, maintaining power structures. I think that is an important thing to try and address early. Um, but I, it's also hard to argue against everybody being, say, fitter, stronger, happier. I mean, I mean, look at here in Second Life. You know, very few people choose um, ugly avatars, for example. And in a sense, our avatars are maybe the dream of how we would like all people to be. And we all. We're all young. We're all 25 forever and so forth. So some of the uh, commentary in the um, a local chat is that um, Syzygy says CRISPR is already, quote unquote, universally available. Um, and uh, Max Chatnoir says practically nothing is universal. And that just prompts me to think that, you know, nowadays, you know, healthcare, especially in the United States, Extremely expensive. Getting surgery is super expensive. Just getting like a CAT scan can cost five hundred dollars. Uh, you know, depending on your insurance plan, just sort of sort of routine diagnostic tests like that are very expensive. Um, drugs are expensive. Everything is expensive. CRISPR, on the other hand, is just infinitesimally the in uh, just an infinitesimal amount of the cost of these kinds of standard. Healthcare costs we have now. I mean, compared to surgery, if you could just fix something with gene editing for a hundred dollars or something, or I mean, who knows what? So, and so you know, I just feel the chemicals um, necessary for CRISPR, and in a couple of hundred years, the gene editing engines will be extremely well refined and accurate, and so forth, um, reproducible. <clears throat> so um, that. Um, it's it'll just uh, transform that the landscape of healthcare, um, and really, and that will be a driving engine to make it universal. But the fact that it will be so cheap will really create a demand for it. If people can escape the high costs of normal healthcare, yeah, and I think you know once we start thinking about things being universal with CRISPR, maybe things are cheaper, right? So even in you know, if people can get germline editing where then subsequent generations don't need to pay more money every year or every person, uh, you know, that does benefit everybody. Um, I, I don't want, I want to conclude on on one point since I want to give um, Vic his, his Yes, uh, we're going all over time. That's okay. Yeah, I was wondering if I should cough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, that's that's my bad. Um, I'll, uh, I'll uh, go ahead and finish your thought there, Stephen, and we'll, mo we'll move on quickly to uh, Phil. 
That, well, what would really be nice to have, and this, you see this with international consortiums of scientists and policymakers, would just be a buy-in to what we as humans and as governments believe are the right moral compasses. And this doesn't have to do just with genome editing, but it has to do with distributions of money, distributions of wealth, agriculture, food, um, even things like iPhones, things that are luxury items that make people happy and are entertainment. And I think that it's really, I, I, I do urge, of, I, I'm a scientist and I wanna move science and technology forward and look for those benefits, but I think it is worthwhile to be cautious about this technology when we have, I think, in the, in the internationally such a bizarrely contentious moral compass about simple things like food. And so the germline being, I would even argue more precious in the long term than what our food distribution is right now, that these are really important things that we need to come to some degree of consensus before we, we dive in too far. So I'm gonna leave it at that. And um, thanks everyone for listening. Thanks for the participation in the chat. And uh, again, I'm always free to follow up if people want. Thanks very much, Stephen. I appreciate that. I appreciate you uh, um, uh, being concise about it too. I apologize for extending the uh, discussion to eat up our time here and getting into uh, into Phil's time. But um, let's move on to our next topic, uh, which I think maybe we can have a little bit more of a freeform discussion. But uh, uh, Phil, why don't you um, just make some introductory remarks about the whole, uh, uh, well, whatever you want to talk about the the colonizing alien planets or any other sort of uh, scientific ethical issues that uh, are on your mind? Yeah, I'm gonna swing wide when it comes to ethics. The first thing I wanna say is uh, from an ethics standpoint is we try to keep these presentations to an hour. Um, if you need, if all you have is an hour today and you need to leave, remember that they're being recorded and you can find them on the Science Circle website. Um, when we were planning this, I was asked to talk about uh, future ethics, essentially how we might act towards uh, life if we discover it outside uh, the Earth. And since the future is speculative, I'll try to put some things in perspective because our views change over the years. If we were having this conversation 100 years ago, it'd be very different. So we don't just wake up one day and say, gee, I think I'll be ethical. Um, what we once thought was perfectly acceptable, we might look in horror at today. And so even as recently as the last century, remember that anthropologists would describe other people in terms of their own culture. It's kind of the, um, uh, well, these primitive people are quaint, but they're obviously not British, you know, that kind of uh, mentality. Um, for those that don't do formal research, remember that ethics, the whole idea is to protect the subjects and the data. And the people, excuse me, the subjects may be people, they may be animals, plants, bacteria. And one of the reasons I'm concerned about how we might approach life outside the earth is we tend to be concerned with, and you can hear it from the discussion today, we tend to be concerned with living things that we view as closest to us. So, you know, we're concerned with the primates and the dolphins, et cetera. And, but living things outside the earth may be very different. In fact, actually, the first ones we might find are bacteria. Well, will we care whether we run over the bacteria on Mars or not, which we may have already done, or at least in, in some parts? Um, you'll recall that in early exploration, and even at the beginnings of uh, religion and such, that there were religious ideas about uh, humans' role to dominate uh, the earth, at least that's one translation of it. Um, we also thought that uh, as we explored and found people in other parts of the world, we thought it was our responsibility, for example, to civilize the heathens. Um, in the United States in the 1800s, uh, there was also what was called manifest destiny, which was the imperialist cultural belief that we were destined to expand and essentially run over whoever was there. It's been alluded to um, here. Now, you know, if you think about it today, if we look at history, unless you've actually read the uh, original texts on it, is that a lot of what we think about perhaps aliens or alien life or whatever comes from movies, right? 
Okay, so uh, think back, uh, say, the day the Earth stood still in 1951. Uh, Everybody was pointing guns at the spaceship. I mean, even before they didn't do anything, all they did was land. Everybody's pointing guns and tanks at the spaceship. And the first time this big robot moved, they they shot the the uh, alien. You know, so it's it's a fear thing. And later, yeah, I know, <laughs> I was too. And so later, though, if you were a fan of Star Trek, they had a prime directive where essentially somebody like uh, the alien in the day the earth stood still wouldn't be able to just come down to earth and go, okay, if you guys don't shape up, we're going to annihilate all of earth. Uh, basically they said, okay, yeah, exactly. Uh, they basically in Star Trek, they basically said, okay, may let's see if they're, in other words, let's just leave them alone for however many centuries it takes until uh, they come to a point where they're not annihilating each other, which, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that might be one of the reasons we haven't seen intelligent life so far, because we're obviously not anywhere near close to that. Um, then you had later on movies like, uh, for example, in, in uh, 1968, 2001, A Space Odyssey. Um, well, you might know that there were books that followed 2001 A Space Odyssey, and one was made into a movie that was about 2010. And essentially, it, there was a squabble between U.S. and Russians and stuff when they went out to Jupiter. And if you remember, at the very end, it basically said there was this godlike voice that, or in text, really, that said, all these worlds are yours except for Europa. You know, uh, attempt no landing there, use them together, use them in peace. Um, so we're still kind of getting the, <laughs> the, uh, all these worlds are yours type of mentality, meaning that what does that mean? In other words, if you actually look back in religion, uh, are we supposed to be dominant over the earth or are we supposed to be caretakers of the earth? Uh, that's another way to translate that. Um, and then, of course, you get into the 90s when things are getting kind of weird anyway. And you've got Independence Day and Mars Attacks, real funny. And then you've got Contact. And the movie Contact in 1997 was essentially at the very end, well, let's not tell them that we actually discovered life because maybe they can't handle it, that sort of thing. And then, of course, the movie Avatar 2009, where you've got the... Um, noble uh savages and of course what was the point of that where you go yeah killer to uh, uh killer tomatoes um you've got the people coming into that world and then mining the world and disrupting the lives of the people there in the movie avatar so there's lots of different ways that we've looked at uh aliens and how we're going to be treating um other worlds so let's take a look then at explore exploration itself. Uh, one is that if you if you think about it, we've been using space as a dumping ground ever since the very beginning. Uh, one person said, well, that's the cost of business. Well, it maybe is. In other words, if we can't expend the rockets and stuff up there, then it might be cost prohibitive to do stuff. But there's a lot of um, junk up in space that we've already left up there. And on the moon, uh, Max might get more into this, but essentially there's little tardigrades. I think we, we left the astronauts poop and other stuff up there. And in, in addition to kind of littering <laughs> at the landing site, it looks like a big garbage dump. <laughs> and then there's the ethics of with the Voyager spacecraft that with the map. And a lot of people said, oh, my goodness, you're telling the aliens where we are. Because if you remember the little map that came with it, it showed what we look like. It showed exactly where our planet was. And uh, then there, were the, there was the um, record that had all the voices. And, and luckily, the message was, uh, if you come near, you know, the message was not, if you come near us, we're going to kill you. The message was more or less, hi, welcome. And it was all in different languages uh on earth and such like that so we've we, we've been wrestling with this idea of who people outside of earth are going to be like 
And I, I just said people, but obviously, like I said, they're not going to be anything like people is more like it. Um, so now we're talking about, remember that when we went to the moon, when the astronauts returned, we put them in isolation until we knew that there might not be something there. Of course, we haven't done the same with Mars, for example, is that someone was mentioning that uh, there could very well, the spacecraft themselves, we know how hardy life is, could the spacecraft that we've sent to Mars could have life on it even after a long voyage in space, and it could have easily contaminated the area around those spacecraft already. Uh, fortunately, we haven't landed in any place where we know there's life, but um, it may be too late in some cases uh, right now. Uh, I'm hoping that the spacecraft that, when are they launching at the end of the year? Uh, to this year that goes there that's trying to look for life. I'm hoping that they have done some really careful sterilization of it. Otherwise, we could end up looking for life there and saying, oh, yeah, hey, it looks just like Earth. Well, no kidding. It well, just came the, from the, the Mars rover that's going to go look for life. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> OK, but what if it isn't? What if it doesn't have DNA? What if it in other words, what if all we discover is bacteria? Are we going to? Go ahead. Well, well, yeah, I, uh, I just wanted to uh, mention uh, there is a great moment in the movie Contact where Ellie says something to the effect that, well, you know, for all we know, we're nothing more than a, you know, an anthill in the middle of nowhere compared to these aliens. And then her yeah. says, right. And how guilty would you feel if you exterminated an anthill in the middle of nowhere? <laughs> exactly. It, it's the ultimate um, golden rule about doing unto others what you <laughs> would hope they do <laughs> or treat you. Uh, right? there, is, there is also the uh, Star Trek uh, Next Generation episode where they terrafor they're terraforming a planet which they believe to be sterile. But uh, due to some mysterious deaths on the on the terraforming uh, crew, they discover that there is a, a crystalline uh, sort of uh, uh, sort of yeah, crystalline sort of, entity, sort of, sort of saline solution um, uh, life form, uh, uh, just kind of underneath the sand of the planet uh, that they didn't recognize. And you know, it's got the famous "ugly, ugly bags of water" <coughs> uh, line from uh, when they finally get to communicate with them. So it's very difficult to know whether uh, an alien planet. Uh, you know, truly is sterile. Yes, we we know that life finds a way. Yes, okay. Uh, maybe, plus, maybe, maybe, maybe Venus is another example of that. So, well, yes, and I was going to get to that because there's a couple things that kind of alarmed me recently. One is the idea of the space force. You know, at, at, at one point we decided, well, let's not do that same stupid uh, uh, warring with each other out in space. But now, of course, you know, uh, once the cat's out of the bag, um, there's that. <laughs> uh, so militarization of space may be just around the corner, unless we decide not to. And then the other thing about phosgene in the atmosphere of Venus, if uh, no one's caught that, what the idea was, was they found a chemical which is hard to explain if there isn't some sort of perhaps organic something going on uh, there in the atmosphere, not on the surface of Venus, but just in the atmosphere. Of course, it's still very hostile because you're still talking about mostly sulfuric acid and such, but we know that life exists on Earth in very hostile conditions as well, including the fumaroles and the sea and that, and uh, uh, mud pots and, you know, that sort of thing. But then the Russians come out and they go, well, Venus is really a, a, a Russian planet. And so <laughs> it goes along with the Space Force that uh, you start getting this kind of um, mentality about whose planet is it, you know. It's like Antarctica, at least we've divided that one up. But, you know, is the moon American because we first landed on it, or is it, uh, you know? <laughs> I didn't um, realize that the Russians claimed Venus because of the probe they sent there. Now now they're saying, oh, yeah, we, uh, we went there, so that's our planet now. Well, the, yeah, stand by for the Americans to go, oh, that's our planet. You know, that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, so in other words, uh, do we have free license to exploit another planet? Just go there and, and essentially rape its resources and, and not, you know, in the movie, let's see, there was a TV series uh, recently. Does anyone remember what it's called? But essentially there was that 
concept where you first had some explorers going there and then you had commercialization of Mars and, and then they're trying to find uh, resources and they did discover life and uh, that sort of thing. It, it, I guess it's still in production because there's another um, a year coming up on it. I've, I'm trying to remember the name of it. But uh, so I'm not going to spend, I'm not going to talk much longer because we've already been an hour and 15 minutes or more into this. But the idea is it's, it's purely up to us as to how we, if people, if, if we find life just because it's bacterial or whatever and not a dolphin, are we going to just say, well, it has no value? Uh, or are we just going to exploit a planet and, you know, the heck with the, with the life there because it's the cost of business? In other words, and then is it going to be Star Wars or is it going to be Star Trek? Uh, yeah. And are we thinking of aliens as greeters or eaters? <laughs> so that's kind of what I had to throw out there um, as yeah, an idea about uh, future yeah, ethics. Yeah, interesting. Uh, I may, uh, maybe just to kind of wrap things up with a, a closing thought here, you, uh, sort of exercising my executive position here. But uh, I, I guess I'd just like to finally say that I'm not sure that the Star Trek uh, prime directive of non-interference is a perfect solution. Um, one of the drawbacks of the prime directive is withholding technology and knowledge from other uh, from from uh, other intelligent life forms that we find um, ostensibly so that they can um, are free to develop along their own path. Um, but uh, but uh, but that element of sort of not helping the aliens uh, when we could help them um, is a real tension and, you know, can create hostility between us and the aliens because they want their, you know, they want us to help them or something like that, or they resent the fact that we're withholding technology and things like that. So, um, so even something that might seem as simple to apply as um, the prime directive is actually fraught with all sorts of ethical dilemmas. Yeah, there's been some good movies where the aliens have brought us good technology and such. In other words, and, and cured diseases and stuff. But on the other hand, perhaps they didn't share their weaponry. Right. So, yes. Yeah, so maybe there's a, a, some kind of a middle ground. Uh, where you, so it doesn't have to be an absolute rule. Um, so... Okay, uh, we are uh, well over time, so I want to thank my panelists for participating and for all the effort and thought you put into creating your presentations. And I uh, want to thank our audience uh, for all of their uh, for attending and for all the great uh, discussion going on in the nearby chat. And I want to thank the Science Circle and Chantal and Jess for hosting us. With that, I'll gavel us to a close.